So um, you already know who we are, so I won't waste too much more time on this slide. So just a little bit of an agenda about what we're going to um, try and go through uh, today. I think we've got a, a really good sort of uh, presentation and a really good kind of story to, to go through here, um, which we've put together for you guys. So hopefully you, you uh, can take something out of it. So um, the key takeaway out of a lot of it, and as well as the, the title, to do with the fabrication uh, developments, recent fabrication developments. So the key takeaway, I think, um, will be some of the, the, the specialist stuff around the BMPOS fabrication database, but we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So I'll just do, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction, a bit of an overview just of the recent developments. not going to um, spend too much time on this because um, I really want to get to um, Adam and, and Ben, um, the, the user case stories um, of people actually, you know, these guys uh, actually using the, the content and, uh, on, on projects and how it's, how it's uh, you know, challenges, but it's also, you know, some of the, the really good positive stuff as well. And then um, Ben Lee from Zion's going to do the uh, manufacturer and suppliers perspective, that sort of journey, uh, how that sort of piece of the puzzle comes in. Uh, and then we'll just do a bit of a, a recap at the end and a bit of a future direction, what, where, we're gonna, um, where we're going to. Okay. So the first couple of slides um, I've got here is uh, um, I kind of went back and had a look at some of the older documentation of, of the Boomer Pies initiative and how it came out. So some of these little snippets on these next two slides um, are from that. And all I really wanted to kind of do here was kind of, um, when I looked at it and read it, and, and this is even back even before my time being involved with, with the initiative, um, the key mission statements and the, the key you know, underlining stories of, of, of what the initiative is, is still fundamentally the same. If you have a look, you know, it's the, the, the purpose is to um, you know, develop a unified standard for, for the, the MEP industry. Um, uh, in, in BIM, so it's still that's the, the, the core thing, and so it's um, it's good to see that. Um, the key, this is some of the other little snippets. The, the key keys to success, um, uh, industry collaboration, uh, vendor independence, and, and shared development costs. Th those three things together is really, I think, the strength of the whole initiative. But particularly the, the the collaboration. It is a true collaboration um, effort. The, the whole initiative. Um, so, and you'll, you'll, hopefully you'll see that in today and, and tomorrow when we're going to be doing some other um, present presentations as well. So I just want to really quickly just go through some of the recent developments just to give you guys that perhaps are out there um, using it at the moment or those of you that are, uh, are, are even newer to it, um, what are some of the recent developments that we've uh, added into the template? Um, so some of the things are uh, adding some things like mechanical legend views. Okay, so this has been a bit of a, a big step. Um, in getting this this stuff into the into the template, um, it's it's you know a lot of it is about documentation. So this is is a big part of it as well. So just getting these kind of uh, uh, this kind of consistency through with with tagging, with 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 text, with graphical styles, with hash patterns, with that, and tying that into the BIMEPOS specification. So making sure that it's um, that it's all tying in with the duct specs and the and the insulation specs, um, and making sure that it's tied in. So this is all starting to, to come together now. You can, in the latest version of the template, you'll start to see this stuff really combining really well. Okay. Um, so another key thing is um, the generic the generic model libraries. That's been a big big topic over the last couple of years. Obviously, we've been focused heavily on manufacturer specific content, which is um, which is critical and which is you know a, a large part of the initiative. Um, but tying in the generic, you know, the the um, content uh, concept. Uh, stages of projects and tying in that generic uh, that generic content um, and and making them talk to each other those seamless sort of swap outs and things like that we're starting to see that sort of um, come through there's a bit of work involved um, developing that um, as we speak and we're going to be showing a little bit of that tomorrow um, in some live demonstrations that we're going to be showing as well but you can see we're starting to expand out this generic model library um, of part builders works um, uh, um, elements, uh, penetrations and plinths and things like that, as well as the, the, the key IFM, BIMEPOS, BIMEPOS IFM Industry Foundation model, uh, models like fire dampers and the, um, the um, uh, air terminals and the fans and things like that. Okay, so you, you, you'll start to see some um, expanded developments um, on that as we, uh, as we track through the second half of this year, particularly. One of the other big uh, developments is um, Obviously, the, the fabrication parts. Okay, so there's been a big development or a big update within Revit itself over the last uh, last couple of versions, particularly I guess now in 2017. Um, 
So we are uh, now pursuing on the course of creating a, uh, a BIMEP OZ um, uh, fabrication database. Um, so that's going to sit alongside the Revit, uh, the Revit template and the Revit um, content um, mo moving forward. Obviously, it's still evolving, um, but the key thing here is that this has really been a true collaborative effort. There's many people in the room that have been key um, uh, people that have actually helped to develop this, this database. Um, and particularly getting things like the duct manufacturers um, around and being able to agree and, and actually develop this stuff is really a, another core success story, really, of the initiative. So, um, so more on that, you know, in our workshops and from these other guys as well. Um, but that's one of the key things, being able to even demonstrate that we can swap this out. Um, so, demonstrate that we can swap this out um, with some of the the out of the box tools in Revit now, with converting um, native Revit to uh, to fabrication parts. Um, there's still, you know, there's still some developments to go, and you know using tools like the route and field to be able to maybe patch holes that are potentially still there, but um, more on that uh, you know, tomorrow. So that's a key thing. One of the other things that we're uh, looking at um, and that we've started to develop is a BIMEPOS sample model. This, this, I think this is going to be a big step as well in actually um, helping to promote it, helping to, to demonstrate it, helping to train even. We're gonna, it's going to be a future training tool. The idea of this model is to have... Um, this is only a really small part of it. There really is quite a lot in here, in this model. Um, but one of the key things I wanted to point out just quickly here was that we're going to be able to start to demonstrate now how we can show different levels of detail um, with the BIMEPOS content and with the BIMEPOS fittings, for example. So we can have these different views showing the different detail. This is just an example of, um, for example, LOD 400, showing now how, we can, how we've got the tags working, how we've got the... Um, working with the equipment, how we've got um, you know, the, the line weights and, and things working, being able to detail and filters and, and things like that. Um, so some of the other just core um, updates, just to quickly run through, not going to spend too much time on this, but line weights um, and styles um, being overhauled, text and styles and dimensions, materials, okay, that's another, another area that's now being developed um, from input from, from key, key guys in the, in the initiative. Um, Additional systems, tags, um, updated views and filters and templates, but then also the IFM uh, schedules and, and manufacturer schedules. Okay, so tying in those shared parameters and getting that really to work as well with with the specifications. A um, couple other quick things. So this little snippet here was another little um, in the grey here was another little uh, kind of blurb I got from an older document, but really it does still tie in what is the core message of the Bumapos initiative, having an, having a, um, in industry, for the industry supply chain, having a, a, a set of standards, basically. And that's, um, it's been mentioned earlier as well, but there's a really a big push happening with that now with the, with the technical uh, specification user groups. Um, it's really, really gaining a lot of momentum, and so you're starting to see a lot of that. It's all, it's all kind of coming together. So the key user groups are uh, really well established now. Um, in terms of technical user groups, Sydney and Adelaide um, are, are well established. Uh, it's, there's stuff happening in Melbourne and Perth um, and, in, and in Brisbane and other states and it's, it's, it's starting to gain some momentum. Um, the website, really quickly, um, the website has been consolidated. This is another big step. So it's just bimfoz.com.au now, which is, which is, which is great. Um, it's basically, if I just can quickly um, show, it's just basically made up of three microsites. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Shannon and, and the other guys can talk more about, you know, the, the initiative itself and the, and, the, and the forum side, but where we kind of come into it in terms of our involvement is the key part is the subscribers page. In terms of the technical side, this is now where you go, this is the one-stop shop for all of the technical side of, of BIMEP OZ. So all of your content, um, the shared parameters, the template, everything is, 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 in, in, is in this microsite here. Um, and that just gives you an, an idea of what the website looks like. If you haven't already seen it, you've got links to those different pages of generic models and manufacturer content, etc. Um, the fabrication stuff will start to filter through here as it's, as it's developing. As I said, it's, it's being released basically as we speak, almost this week, in, in the last few weeks, but this will um, uh, yeah, um, continue to develop. Um, and documentation, uh, there's been some overhauls on the documentation as well. So template outline documents, shared parameter outline documents, um, starting to make them come more in line with the BIMEP OZ um, documentation. 
um, making it all look nice and consistent, but also overhauling what's actually in there, which I guess is the more important thing, um, based on these recent updates and developments, and getting the core information in, not making a phone book, but making something that's a core um, manual that can be utilised by, by you guys, by users, and to know what is in there. How do the filters work? How does, how does this work? What, what are the colours? You know, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Adam from AECOM now, and he's going to start with uh, our user journeys. All right. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So uh, I'm speaking on where I was previously uh, and how we implemented the BIM Apples uh, standards in Malaysia. And then I'll cover uh, what we've been doing at AECOM. I haven't really been uh, directly involved. That was stuff prior to my arrival, but I'll show two examples of projects, uh, both with the same contractor and just outline the experiences there. So, uh, so YTL is a, a contractor, builder, owner uh, group in Malaysia. They operate buildings throughout the world. Uh, they had an in integrated design construction group. Um, which was a pure overhead. We wouldn't build for anyone else but the business. Uh, so they do about a billion dollars US a year uh, as an overhead there. Um, we would build mostly in Malaysia and Singapore and we own hotels, uh, residential, power, the high-speed rail if you've ever been to KL is, is partly owned by the company, the 4G network, all these sorts of things. So. Um, the goal was I came over there to, they were all working in, in 2D uh, methods and the goal was really to bring the design team up but then also to streamline that work across the other disciplines as well. So uh, the size of the projects were always big. As I said, we'd be doing a, about a billion a year. We also owned 30% uh, of the concrete market and had our own rebar facilities as well. So. Um, so when I first came in, one of the, you know, as the discussions were going, you know, what are we doing? Are we engaging the subcontractors? And, and with the way that we did business over there, YTL would actually procure all the work and we just had very low skilled labour forces as well. So there really wasn't a, an effort or a need or anything like that. When we started looking at these guys, we'd be lucky to get fabrication drawing back three or four months after it had been installed, if ever. Um, there wasn't an ask for it. There was a lot of variation orders being done on site. So we're getting a lot of this trades where we're redoing the trades again and again, pulling things out, people are complaining, uh, all those sorts of things as well. So when we started looking at that, the other, the other issue we had when we looked at our procurement methodology is it was just weird. So we would package uh, level one, level two uh, electrical lift core or something like that, but that would be it and then be 30 other levels go to another another supplier and, and someone would do some of the plant room and two other rooms, but then next door another supplier would be doing something else. And this was actually a market condition due to the small labour forces because a lot of other big guys did this as well that there, wasn't, there, there aren't labour forces big enough to mobilise these really big groups. So as a result of that, they had to pick these weird packages and I, I don't know how the procurement team did it, but that's how they, they worked around it. So it was a very complicated reward system as well. So, and lastly, the couple of subbies that did potentially show interest wanted a tonne of money, um, which wasn't, well, wasn't going to happen. So what we started looking at then was we started going back to the design team and what they were delivering to the subbies. So our design team was, you know, doing a lot of 2D CAD, uh, very ba single baseline drawings, you know, very, very basic stuff. And so when the subbies came on board, they were sort of working off draw our drawings if they, if they got some of the equipment side of things. But again, because our drawings were so low, they just install it wherever they want. And then we'd get into big fights about the variation orders because we wouldn't want the, you know, the time loss and the equipment loss and ripping things in and out. So there was a lot of wastage on that. So what we then started talking about was coming up with the idea of set out models, uh, which we, which the design team would deliver to the subcontractors. And these weren't, these aren't fabrication drawings. It's literally showing the dimensioning re in relations to the grids and set outs of every single bit of pipe, where they start, where they stop, all that sort of thing and delivering that to the subcontractors during both the tender and construction drawings and then being able to follow that on with, it, with our team um, in terms of the site installation. Uh, one of the other processes of that that we were able to control is because we were able to manage that, that particular process, we're then able to refocus our engineering design. So in early stages, 
a lot of the times engineers are, are trying to put lights in, in drawings and we're like, we don't need that. We'll just get some Excel spreadsheets of the room designs, pump in the lights, and there's our requirements. We'll work till we start dealing with the client to do that sort of thing. Um, with the model coordinate, approve and document system, we then went to the idea of getting our site engineer in first and he'd do tours of the plant rooms. And then from there, once the model of the plant room was approved with the heights, then we would start to do the full documentation of that work. So, um, and I did miss the just-in-time stuff, so I will speed through this. So the reason we chose BMIA is one, we had the option to build our entire library and we could hire a bunch of guys and spend a year and all this sort of thing, but the system conformant already there. Um, the rest of the team was working in Revit, Architect, you know, that's the way I got to pick how it goes, so that's just what happened. So there was no need to go through anything else. We weren't doing any fabrication, so again, there, there wasn't that need to produce that level of drawings. The consistency in the parameters, and you know, the, the BMA is getting a lot of community support. There's a lot of other people to talk to, Jeff and, and these sort of guys, so whenever I had problems or issues, I had, I had go-to as well. So. That's how we started working through that. So in these cases here, this is where we start taking people through those models. So um, how did we go about implementing it? Um, again, we just downloaded it and started using it. We didn't customize it or anything. Uh, we had a few of the CAD guys going, oh, we need to change this and that. I want my symbol to look like this. We just went to the directors and went, you're doing a whole new approach. Why are you trying to make it look like the old approach? And uh, they were like, that's a Pretty good point. I don't even know what a layer is. Go get it sorted. So uh, our implementation time was pretty fast. I downloaded stuff. I stuck it in a folder. Let's go. Um, so the development of the set out drawing. So this is sort of a typical side of, of our plant rooms with some fire boosters and that sort of thing. So so the whole goal here was to you know show the show the expected location of elements. Um, and, and, you know, there were tolerance expected in this uh, quite high, I thought. But, um, but again, we, you know, indicated the, the heights of the items, where they were in relation to, to bits and pieces. We generate a lot more elevation drawings and things like that, but it was all managed for, for the plant room spaces. Now, in this particular job, I don't know if I have the picture for it, no. But um, when I first went and inspected the plant room, um, the plinths were all in totally wrong locations pumps had been set up somewhere else and all that sort of thing. So the very first job was, was basically ignored because it was typical of the culture there. And we had to go through a few VA, VOs and, and labor rectification on that sort of thing. And they came on board after that, particularly with the fire team. But again, you only have to hit them once with the whip and that, you know, they're not doing it out of malice or anything. It's just changing that mentality of working. So uh, the other part was the development of the builder's work, so actively labelling all our pipe sleeves, all our penetrations through every wall, every slab. Um, we had a site in implementation team, uh, and so everyone whinges about where the it's the architect going to do them, it's the engineer singer, oh, the mech guy. We just said site implementation, it's up to you guys to coordinate and manage the panos, and, and the team was happy with that. So we just focused it on one area of accountability. Uh, these were separated linked models where they would paste, put these uh, face-based families and then detail them all up and others could schedule and re-coordinate around them. Um, so as I said, yeah, changing on site. So this is a couple of examples of where we were walking through. Uh, we implemented a tool called Revis2. Uh, it's quite good. It's integrated uh, issue tracking and, and could be done all that. And it was really about getting the, the engineers to walk through the models, our site engineers. We'd walk them through. And before we started documenting anything, because we'd move things and we'd move things. And why create some drawings when we can just get them in, have a look at the model, put some markups and layouts and stuff, and getting them in for half a day save a week of generating drawings. So. Um, and so that was, that was really the, uh, the, the YTL process. There's a whole bunch of other things, but um, it was pretty successful. Uh, as I said, we, we started getting a couple of jobs where um, for the fabrication drawing, especially in our rainwater downpipe, which our architects end up doing, uh, we just get the paper back and they just glued their logo of the top of ours and they hadn't photocopied it again or anything. It was just a piece of paper with the glue on it. So uh, that was, people go, oh, well, that's dangerous. And I'm like, no, because they're, they go, they're agreeing to deliver exactly what we want. So that was that. So, um, so I'll jump onto the AECOM side now. So um, I'm going to cover two projects. Uh, we did both of these projects uh, with AJ Coombs. Um, and they were two very different workflows. So the first one is uh, Telstra NEC. 
It was a project that was done prior to AECOM's implementation uh, of, of the BIM Oz template. And then the other project there is the, the Darling Harbour, Sydney Darling Harbour, which was done after. And, and again, very two different ways of working, but, but we'll go through sort of the, the pluses. Well, the minuses in a couple, but then pluses on the other. So, um, so with, the, with the model on the Telstra NEC, uh, this, is, this was two buildings. This was a data center on one side and then the energy generation plan on the other. Uh, the, the, main, the main points were it was done very, I guess, early BIM. You know, everyone's coordinating on the design side. It's all great, coordinate, coordinate, coordinate. And then there wasn't, I guess, a lot of the, the clauses in place. So when it came to the handover, sort of threw it over the fence. And, uh, you know, it was built on various AECOM bits and pieces. It, you know, it wasn't schedulable, it wasn't all that. So. Uh, in terms of the outcomes on this project, it was it was pretty hard to ascertain because one we only we we only coordinated internally, so we didn't engage um, the subcontractors on our behalf to get engaged with that process. Um, there was some initial discussions about BMA. AJ Coombs came and said, "You should probably look at this." We're ah, we've got our families. They're great, you know. Um, and so due to these processes. Uh, it wasn't that, I, like I ultimately don't, we don't know whether the result back to Coombs was good or bad because there was no communication, it was good, but there, was, there wasn't the communication level back from our guys as well to, to, to know that it worked out. And that, and that was definitely a part of our problem, but one of the key decisions that came out of that process was, hang on, why are we playing in our own little silo here, we need to drop this and we need to come across to the BMA template and that sort of thing. So after that, the decision was made to switch, and uh, the 2014 template, I think, was the one where they just incorporated that. So a um, couple of things that people whinged about, uh, engineers mostly, uh, flanges. For some reason, mechanical engineers don't like flanges. They go, oh, you got a flange on there, they're going to fabricate it like that. They're going to build it just like that. Like, no, they're not, no, they're not. Yeah, they will take the flanges off. So there was this big argument uh, we ended up attempting to take the flanges off. As you know, starting to butcher the whole content. Some have flanges, some don't. And then, you know, everyone just gets even more cranky because you're like, ah, oh, there's flanges, there's no flanges. So it's little things like that. So again, with, with this stuff, if you haven't implemented or doing these systems, I'd really just push for keeping it as standard as possible because as soon as you start changing it, you've got to maintain those changes yourself and you've got to be thorough and go through every single piece of content. And it's just not realistic unless you've got big budgets to do it, basically. Um, so yeah, again, it's those, those little things of just re making sure that, that your team at the engineering level is aware that this is how it's going to be from now on and just suck it up, um, which works good in theory. <laughs> um, so the, so the Darling Harbour project was, was a totally different uh, environment. Um, we, had, we had the guys coming over, Aja Coombs were coming into our office, they were actually, they were actually going through our models. Uh, during the design phase, we were looking at all that stuff. We had guys like, we had um, a few of the guys actually take portions of the work and then they'd work on that model. We'd bring that back in, they'd be editing our Revit model. So pr prior to even the, the looking at the fabrication, we were getting a lot of their input on this side of things. And again, there was that benefit of, well, if I can draw it now for you guys, I don't have to draw it again when it's wrong or, or incorrect or whatever it might be. So there was that real integrated sharing. And again, that, that went straight through to construction. Um, and again, I wasn't directly involved in this project, so I'm only speaking from the experiences of what I heard from the design teams on both sides. But everyone, you know, everyone got along. There was a call. People would come in, would work on the models together. There, there was a lot of this. In, you know, the liability side of things was really removed. So, as a as a result, I think everyone had a pretty pretty good outcome of that. So, so again, I guess it, to to sort of finish off, you know, it's not about company standards. It's not about templates. It's about outcomes. What are we actually trying to do here? Are we trying to deliver a drawing, or are we trying to build something for somebody? Um, and that's where you know all these other arguments sort of fall on the wayside. So spending the time on on customizing a template, what is the real benefit of that for the project? You know those sorts of things. What is you know engaging the subcontractors and really getting to handhold, regardless of the contractual arrangements. Sometimes they're going to be nice and friendly, 
Other times, you know, you're not going to have as direct links as you'd like, but you know, still that that engagement's the key part of all of this, uh, which again, everyone knows. But yeah, I guess my, my main outcomes of uh, incorporating BMA is just download it, put a few things on top if you need to, but don't touch it. Um, it's pretty good. Winch to the guys if there's bugs and they'll take care of them. But, but overall, trying to then take it and really butcher it is, is not going to go well. So uh, thank you very much. I'll pass on to, to Ben now to, to continue on. So. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, look, I'm just a simple draftsman, just going to speak about simple drafting things today uh, with the integration to BIM EPOS. Uh, I work for O'Connor's. We're a South Australian Tier 1 contractor. Uh, my journey with BIM started uh, around seven years ago is when I made the jump from 2D to 3D. Uh, O'Connor's made the jump about five years ago, I'd say. Um, when, when I came across, I had my several years of BIM development. Uh, you know, and then O'Connor's had their development and trying to merge that together. Obviously, uh, any drafter using the software knows you, you can't do it unless you have that shared database to begin with. Um, and that's where I guess from day one, you know, I think O'Connor's looked and said, but there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to collaborate. Um, you know, there's a whole new era to approach. Uh, and that's where we, we, looked to, we looked for a solution and the solution was simply BIM Mepoz. Uh, to use that as a foundation and build upon that, that way it, it gives you the ultimate flexibility. Um, you're still always going to have to build upon it. It is only a base foundation to go with, but it means that I can start to uh, start to collaborate. Um, the word the word uh, during this whole journey I seem to hear five times a day is collaborate, collaboration. It's all it's all about collaborative approaches, and that's where BIM at POS uh, can help you out. The fact that it's uh, uh, built by users for users, it's, it's built by the industry, uh, multiple companies involved, there's far more companies than this, so I just ripped that off the website. Uh, and that's, that's why I want to be part of it, I, wanna, I can see that this is, uh, there's a movement going on, uh, and that's where we want to be part of that movement, I guess. Uh, and uh, mo moving into a whole new era, with people uh, having this standard approach, uh, you're always going to have your company manipulated content, but the fact that... Uh, I can now access a network of people. Um, that's where I'm seeing the future approach is, uh, you know, for, for example, I can build a new relationship perhaps with competitors. I, I can build a relationship with Coombs and go, hey guys, I'm, uh, I'm under the pump right now and hey, you guys don't have a lot of work, can I borrow a drafter for a couple of weeks? And we can actually hit the ground running from day one because I can get, I can get somebody on board, they understand the, the functionality, how the content works, the naming conventions, you know, and they don't have to spend three, four weeks getting up to speed. And that's, that's where I start to see the key benefits of all this. So uh, we'll jump on in. I want to go straight into some model statistics here uh, with actually how much content we are using. So we've got a first example. I've got two examples here. The first one here, uh, just a, a plant room, uh, comprehensive prefabrication on this one. So a lot of custom elements to it. Uh, I do apologise for the Lego block chillers, didn't put a lot of effort into that, but everything else looks pretty good. Uh, so yeah, we, we've got um, a lot of customization done here, and statistically when we draw plant rooms, we're averaging that sort of, I don't know, 65% success rate with BIMEPOS uh, foundation stuff. And the rest of it for plant rooms is always going to be custom, they're, they're so unique, our industry is so unique. Um, you know, this plant room, you know, had stainless steel systems and PVC systems and obviously every piece of equipment was one off. Uh, so overall, 65% seems to be a great success rate for these sort of things for me. Uh, you know, with, with, with some of the recent template updates that we've just achieved, uh, that statistic would comfortably get bumped up to about 75%. So some great things coming out. Uh, sort of a typical floor layout. Um, obviously a greater success rate with this sort of stuff. Uh, so we're sort of we're sort of bumping up to the you know 75 80 percent, and that's that's constant um, project to project. Everything in red is uh, straight out the box. Bim at pause. Yes, you know we manipulated it and modified it to suit ourselves, but we're not talking heavy modifications. I simply went in there, reset the default dimensions to suit my manufacturing. I purged out the things I didn't want. Uh, 
but basically, you know, we're using it out the box. It can be achieved. Um, we haven't really entered that full merge into fabrication yet, so we have to detail our models to the nth degree, um, and we're achieving that with the current content, um, plus and minus a few things that are recently just been added in as well now. Um, I'd, I'd say hearing a few people today, there's been a big, uh, seems I keep hearing people, people, people. Um, that's my favorite part to, to what this initiative is. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something that involves people, it's something that you can provide feedback for, it's something that you can be part of and actually progress with the industry. Um, so we've got a couple of states that are running the user groups. SA has one, we've had one for a few years, uh, mostly built up of contractors, but we're getting, uh, we're, we're getting uh, interest from uh, people like KBR who are going, we need to change our way, how do I do this? We know it's not just about the content, we want to be part of the working group to help that future progression. Um, these things are great. We meet up, you know, once a month, twice a month, every now and again. Uh, you know, just, just grabbing a bunch of guys in the same room and just, just getting up to speed what's going around town. Um, you know, and then of course actually moving on into uh, what's happening with BIMEPOS, reviewing the current templates, uh, looking at all the specifications, uh, providing feedback for what we think should be the next uh, future progressions. Um, and getting that, get, getting that in the system uh, has just been gold for us. Uh, and then moving up the line, you've got the National Working Group. Uh, you know, I thought this thing was a fairy tale before I got involved in the initiative, uh, but it does exist, and it's a, it's a beast of a beast of a thing that they've created. Um, every, every specification that you see, every template release that you see, uh, huge work goes into this stuff. Um, I got the opportunity uh, to be recently involved in a few of these through my involvement with the user groups. Um, you know, we, we did a we did a few uh, a damper workshop a while ago, and just just the fact that it it wasn't just built by one person sitting in the corner and just pumping it out. You know, we uh, we invited the uh, the supply chain. Uh, we had uh, about three different manufacturers there. We had a couple of designers there, contractors there, uh, the project technical board there, and obviously everyone's just criticising everyone. Um, and that's why this this sort of stuff does take a long time. That that's why you have to use BIM at POS as that foundation and build upon it because it is kind of slow moving, but that's because it goes through these huge processes uh, actually involving the whole industry. Um, you know, and trying to, just trying to find that line where you can all agree. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that certainly has been happening and it's great to see it's, uh, it's continuing. Now, so we'll have a quick look at um, what you get with BIM EPOS. Um, straight out the box, Autodesk stuff. Look, you know, I'm not here to shred them to pieces. They provide the tools and the opportunity to manipulate it and modify it. We'll leave it, we'll leave it at that. When you get BIM at POS, they've taken those tools, they've taken the 60,000 million things that could be possibly in there, and they've gone, here's a handful of standardised stuff that we, we see as, uh, as the primary objects in our industry. And they've said, use that, because that's the first approach to standardisation. Um, that exists within the template. That exists within the specifications as a great guideline, um, great sort of training referencing tools for up and coming guys as well. Uh, we're seeing uh, the foundation models being developed and as, and as they are slowly developed, the, the uh, associated schedules are being put into the template. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, using this thing out the box, myself going back many years ago when I first jumped in to the uh, Revit side of things, uh, if, if you're a newcomer into BIM, this thing will get you up to speed within six to six to 12 months jump ahead within the first week of using it, no doubt about it, because it's got that multiple years of experience building up into it. Um, of course, if you, know, if you are a more experienced user and you haven't implemented BIM EPOS, it's, it's a great tool to complement your, your, your existing services, uh, what, what you've done. Um, it can bring you into that whole new edge of um, of how to uh, how to sell BIM, you know, when I when we go for a new project, we're always got getting asked the question, "What's your BIM capabilities?" Well, I'm not, I don't I don't sit there and sell clash detection and sell this. I sell collaboration. I sell the fact that I can use BIM Pos and it's and it gives you the best possible chance um, to use that model in the future. It's not locked out to a company. Um, yes, you've added on to it, but you've added on to the core foundation that it begun with, uh, and that's how we use BIM Pos as someone who's been doing BIM for quite a while now. Um, you know, a bit of a sneak peek of the fabrication stuff that's coming out. Uh, 
I'd, I'd sort of give this uh, working with the working with the uh, various user groups, the industry. I think this thing's about to be uh, released in a couple of weeks, um, and this has been one of those ginormous workflows. Uh, this thing's been 12 months in the making, plus probably a few extra months on top of that. Um, this is a it's, this is a perfect place for people that want to enter that fabrication. Obviously. Uh, BIMEPOS did this with 2016, uh, releasing fabrication features in Revit. Uh, they sort of went, well, yeah, 2016 wasn't working, but hey, we can get 12 months of development for when it does work, and that's exactly what they did. So back and forth, they've uh, stripped out the database. Uh, anybody that's used fabrication, um, and you grab the out-of-the-box database, it freaks you out. Um, you know, I don't want to say it, but it's just overwhelming corrupted data. There's too much in there. And if, you tr and if you're trying to just get into that field, you just don't know where to begin. But what BIM Boz did is they stripped that back. They created what you need and only what you need to get started. And for myself, coming on board into fabrication now, that's what I, need, uh, that's what I needed to get myself uh, on top of what fabrication is because it's a beast of an exercise. There's so much to it. Um, but now you can start with, uh, with the perfect place and build upon that. Uh, just like the Revit Foundation, it's the, it's the fabrication foundation that you can use. So it's a great place for new people to get into fabrication. Um, uh, once again, for existing people that are already in that fabrication space, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, amazing database that can complement your system. Um, during the 12 months of development, <coughs> Multiple manufacturers actually got on board and built this thing for us. It wasn't just built by a couple of drafters, uh, which it was, but it was built by uh, the actual industry. You know, you, got, you had Kavanaugh's and duck makers, uh, tin men locally in SA actually went, hold on, I can now tap into this whole BIM world uh, and get on board. And what we saw over that 12 months is multiple manufacturers actually changing their systems because they could see this thing coming. Uh, so we saw, we saw multiple duck shops realign their entire independent databases to align with the, the new BIMEPOS naming conventions, which uh, actually now we can achieve um, producing a Revit model, converting it to fabrication, and sending it off for manufacture. A lot of people sell that, but the fact is there's always a huge amount of rework in there that you never get sold. Um, but we can actually achieve that now through a you know, collaborative approach with the naming conventions. It sounds like such an easy, no-brainer task, but there was a huge amount of work. Uh, the duck shops, some of them had literally had to uh, you know, uh, rejig all their machinery, reset, the, you know, reset all their settings, and like I said, rebuild their own database because they can see the potential, they can see that they can tap into BIM now, and that's what the database is there to achieve for us. Um, and that's where Econos are certainly looking to leverage BIM. We're looking to use the new BIM EPOS database and tap into multiple resources. So I can, I can grab a model and I can convert that, uh, keep it all natively in Revit, and go out to the industry and go, all of a sudden now, multiple duck shops who are embracing BIM EPOS, it's giving me this flexibility where I can go here, there, and they're not going to change and manipulate my model. I'm not going to give them my model and go to site and go, you built me something different. Oh, that wasn't to my standard. No. Now I can go, you manufacture to the BIM EPOS standard, and you know, it's, it, it gives great more flexibility as a contractor's perspective. Uh, and of course, I can maintain the, the foundation models, such as your air terminals and your dampers, because um, I don't need to send that off for manufacture. That'll be a bought item that I can sell to my supplier. Um, and of course, that, you know, using the BIM EPOS foundation models, they've got embedded uh, scheduling abilities that are just outstanding in there right now. Uh, they're working great, and there's more to come. That's why I made the full integration with BIM EPOS. I can see, I can see what's happening. I can see that I can now start to complete, you know, this circle that we always sort of talk about. I can see that a designer can grab BIM EPOS. I can take that model. Uh, you know, I don't ever expect it to be, uh, you know, clash free or anything. But I can take that and have the best opportunity to manipulate that and convert that to fabrication, and it's all going to have uh, replicating geometry. And then, of course, I can I can pump that out now the model, I can pump that out for fabrication um, to multiple people, to multiple suppliers who are embracing, embracing that uh, new, new sort of era of what's happening. You know, and I can use the foundation models and schedule that out for manufacture. I can swap them out um, and, and maintain a lot of the, uh, a lot of the data in there. Uh, and that, that's where it's all heading. We're finally closing off that circle. Um, so actually merging with BIM EPOS, you know, how, how long does it take? What do you have to do? What's the first stage? Um, 
The fact is I have BIM content, you've got BIM content, we've all got our own BIM standards. Um, in the past, uh, you know, I've been with BIM, BIM Epos since the beginning, and in the past I was just sort of slapping it on the side and I wasn't realising the benefits because I wasn't really using it. It was just slapped on the side and copy and paste a few elements here, copy and paste a system or two here. I wasn't realising the benefits, so I sort of restructured that started as that foundation that I told you about, and I just built on that, I worked on that. Um, so I can update my own content as I go, but I've got that core foundation that I've got to use now. Um, and personally, a, a thing that doesn't really get spoken about a lot is that time frame. Uh, it, for me, it took me a week. Um, I went in there, you know, as a contractor, I've got to make sure everything's dimensionally perfect, I'm building off of my model. Uh, so I went in there and just, uh, you know, I had an action plan and I, you know, I saw it through. I went through every single family, made sure every dimension was there. If it wasn't the shared parameter, I put in the shared parameter from the shared parameter file that exists. Um, you know, and then I slowly added in my own content on top of that. Um, statistically, I was only adding in that sort of 20, 30 percent on top of the template. That's what, that was all I had to add in there. Uh, everything else should be in there. Um, and I made that full movement because, yeah, like I said, I can see what's coming. Um, I can see there's a whole new era of the supply chain actually integrating with BIM Epos. Um, but to get the full benefits, you have to integrate BIM Epos as that foundation. If you slap it on the side, you'll get benefits from it, but you'll never really uh, understand the full benefits from it. Uh, and so I guess to conclude here, I just want to sort of say, um, there was a, you know, we've said people a thousand times today. Uh, I think the key message is that understand your investment. Um, you're not just paying A2K, uh, you know, I don't know what it costs, eight, nine hundred bucks for a subscription. Uh, you're not paying to access the website and grab a bit of data here and there. You're paying to access this network. That's the next generation. You're paying for that, you know, you're paying for that progression, uh, that resource, um, and you can use it. So, uh, just, a, just a final one, um, sort of, closing their comment as well. Uh, we are having a bit of a live demonstration tomorrow. I guess if there's anyone here subscribing to BIM MedPoz who perhaps aren't seeing those uh, benefits or haven't or just want to understand the best way to implement it, uh, catch up with myself or Shannon, Brendan, uh, and we'll have a little private session tomorrow to go through the current templates, what's in there and what's about to come and get your feedback as well on board. So uh, thank you and um, I'll hand over to Ben. Thanks, Ben. Uh, it was uh, about seven years ago uh, that I spoke at the inaugural uh, BIM Map Oz conference down in Melbourne. And um, certainly, uh, BIM Map Oz has come a long way since those, those days. Um, seven years ago, I was working on the uh, model content creation and, and, the, and, and how BIM Map Oz was, was going to collaborate with the manufacturing and suppliers. Um, since that time, uh, BIM Epos has certainly paved the way and uh, created a springboard for the future uh, as to how, um, how, it, how it collaborates with, with, with us and, how, and it made, it's made it much easier for, for innovative and adopting uh, early adopters to, to join the journey with relative ease. From a manufacturer's perspective, I can tell you that uh, it's now much easier to lobby uh, for fight, for, to, to fund BIM, uh, BIM models and to gain investment for content. Uh, the content creation process, uh, which we've done through A2K, is also a lot easier than it was seven years ago. So um, that, that's, uh, that's certainly good. As a global uh, manufacturer of pumps, Xylem's uh, name and tagline has many, many parallels with, uh, with the BIM MEPOS journey, which um, gives us purpose behind the involvement in the industry initiative, such as this. So if we look at the tagline, let's solve water, um, let's is the spirit of collaboration. We've spoken about collaboration many, many, many times today, and uh, solving water is a promise of action. Xylem uh, manufacturers uh, such as Xylem can no longer sit behind the quality of their products and expect that to be enough. We wish to collaborate at every stage 
of the, of the project life cycle. And initiatives such as the, the BIMMAP Oz initiative enable us to do that. Um, we have a portfolio of resources that, that, that follow the complete life cycle from water intake to water return, just as the BIMMAP Oz initiative helps you uh, through the complete project life cycle from conception to end of life. BIMEP Oz has uh, certainly improved our ability as a, as a manufacturer to collaborate and add value to, uh, to our customers and, uh, and to all project stakeholders. Our, our engagement at all levels is, is, is improved uh, and is, con is constantly increasing. One of the questions that, we're co that we spoke about last night and, and, and that we uh, heard a lot today is return on investment. At this stage, um, for a manufacturer, it is still fairly intangible. Um, but as we uh, and as we've heard a lot today, as as the uh, value is um, seen by by the the, the FM companies uh, and the owners of, of the buildings, then we, we certainly see that as early adopters of this technology, that that we're there to 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 join that ride, and we will see that that it certainly starts to gather a, a momentum. Um, closing the loop between specification modelling and, and installed as built is also uh, uh, partially the reason why it's difficult to, to quantify the return on investment for us, to, for us in, in, in model creation. But um, ultimately, the, the, the collaboration that we have with the designers uh, and, and, and the, the more conversations that we have, uh, the better. Uh, ideally, we obviously want to remove the risk of, of low quality substitutions and deliver value for all, but um, we're certainly uh, on the right path. Uh, we have all our model content available, on the, on, uh, produced by A2K on the BIMMET Oz website. I'd like to thank them for the opportunity to speak and um, I'd also like to thank, thank, thank them for their, uh, their content. And um, and over the next couple of days, well, next day and a half, if you uh, want to come and, come and talk to us, that would be very good. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I've just got a couple of uh, just really quick closing slides. I'm not going to spend too much more time on the end here. Um, so just to sort of recap on um, some of the some of those uh, future future um, developments, the future direction, where where we're going, where we're heading, um, to give you a bit of an idea. So the legends um, is a, is a big thing, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So developing those, um, the key thing is to get the other disciplines um, up to speed as well. Okay, so that's still a massive uh, part of the agenda. So to bring that on board is is is. Um, is where we want to want to move it, and where we certainly will be pushing to move it in 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 the next uh, in the next little while. Um, on the on the production of the specifications, the technical uh, specifications, um, I mentioned the 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 technical user groups that are happening, and the other guys have, have you know touched on that as well um, today. Um, you'll start to see you know more more specifications. Exactly what I've just said there. More specifications produced means more content coming out, and and even for the other dis disciplines as well. Um, so that's where that's where it's going um, uh, in in the future. Um, so the fabrication, as I said, a key part of, of the movement of the initiative now. Um, further development of that uh, of that uh, BMA BMFOS uh, fabrication database. Um, as I said, it's still evolving. There are still um, workflows and processes to go through, and that a key part of what uh, Ben mentioned tomorrow um, of tomorrow's workshop come along, um, we're going to talk a little bit and have, a, have an open discussion about those workflows and what the current options are, what's recognised as you know, the key workflows, what you, what you can achieve, what maybe are some of the undesired workflows, and then even open it up and get even some more input from, from guys like yourself. So if you, any of you are keen to have, have some input, um, certainly come along. It's, um, it, should be a productive, uh, it should be a productive morning. Um, so another another um, area is the classification side of things. So omniclass and categor categorization in, in Revit models. 
Um, there's a little bit of work, a, little, a lot of work going on behind the scenes at the moment, but it will come up to the forefront in terms of cate categories and master lists um, for things like OmniClass um, um, and the like um, as well. So that's, you'll, you'll see that coming out shortly too. Um, as I mentioned, uh, workflows as well. So uh, the development of those workflows um, and not only just recognising what those workflows are, but then actually being able to train and actually help implement those workflows. So the key part of it is, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide, the last slide, but is, is, the, is the training side, bringing that back up to speed and back into the picture again. Um, now that you know this, this new material is, is there, being able to help you guys um, imp implement, help end users implement it. Um, so that's going to be a key part of that. Uh, and the sample model, another big step, I think, forward as well, which is going to be really great being able to use that and, and being able to use that as a training tool as well, okay? So, um, yeah, being able to keep adding to that, keeping it as a, as a collaborative effort, so having it you know, shared as it, as it, as it's, it's began um, as, as, a, as a shared um, piece of kit. We're gonna, the plan is to keep it that way, get input um, and keep evolving it. And as the templates update, as the content updates, we load that in and we can start to adjust some of those percentages that we're looking at, okay, what, what is realistic to get out of the Burnpos out of the kit um, from, from the get-go. So that's some of those uh, key uh, future, future directions. Um, there's, there's much more, but come along tomorrow and we can talk about more of that stuff as well. So just lastly, I just wanted to quickly finish up on um, the, the training side of things. So um, look out for, uh, in the booklet in your, in your bag, there's, a, there's a, a page, a flyer about the um, the new uh, BMA Boomerpos passport training um, and service that um, is going to tie into to the initiative and um, and to the the future of, of the training initiatives with with the AMCA and, and with, with Boomerpos um, combined. Um, so have a look out for that. Um, we've got uh, you know new courses being of, um, being introduced in there. Uh, obviously the fabrication is tying into that and where that's going to. Um, where that's going to move, we'll, we'll continue to evolve those those training courses as per the development of the tools and, uh, itself, okay, and 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 what is the the best practice for the industry, which is which is what it's all about. Um, so you get access to that. So have have a look for that. Um, and as I said, yeah, these courses will uh, will continue to grow. Um, and you with that with that uh, passport, um, you get access to the to the kit, to the template, to the content um, as well. So have 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 check and come and see us and have a talk to us if if you want more information about that. Um, so thanks very much. I just uh, I'd love to just quickly thank the, the guys um, um, Ben and Ben and Adam. Um, I reckon that went pretty well. Pro that probably went even better than what I hoped for. I, th um, I think that was pretty seamless having four of us jumping up and down here. So that was a really really great um, great uh, um, story. I thought so. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. And yeah, thank you.